So just a little update. We were ready to start uh, the attorneys who had to go into the back room to speak to the judge. So we're on a slight hold right now. I have Now that officer is uh, sitting to the left of us.
Lisa, he's not in the courtroom right now. We've been ready to go for a little bit. They uh, were prepared to start, and the attorneys had to go into the back to talk to the judge. So we are on a standby right now, waiting for things to get started. everybody to have your cell phones turn the off for silent.
Good morning, everybody. Um, first of all, I want to thank Judge Mark Betleski for letting us use his courtroom to accommodate the uh, additional folks that are here. It's a larger courtroom, and uh, we wanted to make available as much space as possible for the public. And I appreciate his uh, gesture in letting us use his court. I'm also going to remind everybody about my decorum order, similar to um, what we, what I indicated at the last uh, hearing. Again, I understand that there's a lot of um, motion, a lot of tension for the families, the people involved, and I would ask you to uh, conduct yourself in a proper manner. And um, regardless of what happens here, um, remember you're in a courtroom. Conduct yourself accordingly. If there are any disturbances or outbursts, those people will be, or person or persons will be escorted out of here and potentially face contempt charges. Um, generally, it's my normal policy or procedure to have the state of Ohio proceed with sentencing, followed by any victims that they might uh, wish to present, or if there's any members of uh, law enforcement who wish to be heard or family members. Followed by defense counsel and Mr. Robinson, if he wishes to speak, as well as any uh, individuals who defense counsel would like to have speak, at which time I will then go into formal counsel, uh, formal uh, sentencing. At this time then, the record will reflect that Mr. Robinson is in court with counsel. Your Honor, my understanding is he does not want to uh, wait for, for the restitution. So. Okay, thank you. Then we will handle that towards the end, okay. uh, but make sure you remind me that the law requires that the uh, restitution hearing be had at the time of sentencing, um, so we're all here. We'll do it. We'll do it at that time. Uh, again, as I was indicating, before I proceed, then inform, formally, prosecutor Silver, prosecutor disorder, anything further? No, Your Honor. Attorney Yoder. No, 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 no. Thank you. Then uh, again, the record will reflect Mr. Robinson is in court with counsel, having been convicted on 16 of the charged indictment. The pre-sentence investigation in this matter has been waived by the court, as the court uh, is familiar with the facts, having heard the entire trial, as well as familiar um, with Mr. Robinson's background, uh, his lack of a criminal record, and the competency report that gave the court additional information so there would be no pre-sentence report. And it's my understanding that the defendant is not requesting a post-sentence report. If that changes, let me know. The court will uh, consider the oral statements of the parties as well as any pertinent and relevant sentencing factors in this matter. At this time, does the state of Ohio wish to be heard either through one of the prosecutors or through any victims? Uh, I'll be doing the speaking, Your Honor. I, I'm not going to belabor a lot of this because the court had an opportunity to hear from the seven victims that had received convictions for the counts that we had. They know, you know exactly what they went through that day. Um, I would point out to the court that we're going to elect on count three, the first four counts being towards up to the passage. Um, the reason for that is even though it was a felonious assault, the fact that it was a peace officer and the fact that there was serious physical harm, which the jury found makes that a mandatory time count. I think the court is aware also that there are seven year specifications on all seven victims in this case, and that pursuant to 29, 29.14, B1F, little i, and B1F, triple i, um, the two of those have to be run consecutive, and the court has the ability to run the remaining <coughs> seven, seven years, five, seven years facts consecutive, should it choose to. I, I believe, as it comes to officer capacity, Your Honor, that this is the worst form of the offense. Um, he shot him, he, he's, he's gone through multiple surgeries, they continue to this day, uh, he still walks with a limp, and he's unable, unable to do the job that he loves um, any further. I also think it's important when the court goes through and puts sentences on the remaining counts that each separate victim is represented by a consecutive count, by a consecutive sentence. I think that would speak to them as a society that when the police come, it is not your ability to just shoot back at them. Mr. Robinson had a choice, as Ms. Resort said several times during this trial, and chose the wrong one. Now he should face the consequences. Um, it, it's the same quote that the consequences are great. I know the court has 126 years that it has as an option in this case, and the state believes that 
great deal that should be a focus on this event. Thank you, Prosecutor. So on behalf of the uh, state or um, any of the law enforcement members, is there anybody who wishes to be heard, Prosecutor Silva or Prosecutor Desort, before I hear from Mr. Yoder? Very well. Uh, Attorney Yoder, on behalf of Mr. Robinson. Yes, Your Honor. Judge, and I'll defer to the court on how you'd like to handle this. I do have some, some remarks that I'd like to make as well, but there's a family member of Mr. Robinson who would like to make a statement on behalf of the family. Her name is Sandy Baker. She's Mr. Robinson's aunt. All right, let's defer to hear from her now. Yes, let's hear from her now, and then I'll hear from counsel. She's come on over to the podium available. <clears throat> Thank you. 
Congressman. Thank you for your comments. necessary in order to get Martin the help that he needs and they put that responsibility on their shoulders and now he's sitting here facing a significant sentence um, in a life that they never had anticipated or expected of him. Um, I look around this room, Your Honor, may I approach this one? I look around this room and I'm going to show you something that we looked at privately that was never given to the jury but it's a photograph of Martin many years ago, and he's standing next to his grandma, and he's dressed in a uniform, it's a corrections officer uniform. And I look at that picture, Marty being clean shaved, a tight haircut, <clears throat> he's a captain in the corrections uh, uh, department. And I look at these other men and women who surrounded us throughout this, this entire case, these deputies who have been watching Martin, who, who look similar to what he looked like at that time. And think to myself, but for that incident that took place in 2009 that caused him to spiral down this dark path, causing him to have the, the PTSD that he did, causing him to have the traumatic brain injury, that he would be one of these officers standing next to him and not fitting, wearing shackles and stripes. Martin does have problems. I don't think anybody would dispute that. Those issues perhaps arose before 2009. Maybe went undiagnosed, but in 2009 they became exacerbated, and as a result, he was under the constant care and supervision of psychologists uh, that he sought out, that he attempted to go see to try to get help for his PTSD. The PTSD consumes his life, and none of us who have, have never had PTSD can't understand the significant consequences the impact that it can have on a person's life. This was a man that would drive around the street numerous times because he thought that he was being followed by police officers, specifically Cleveland police officers who were trying to come and kill him again. This was a man that has, for his entire life, been a law-abiding citizen of our great state and our country, uh, protecting those, uh, those inmates who needed him. And now, all of a sudden, he turns and tries to protect himself. He does things that you know, he knows is not right, but he does them anyways. There's issues of whether he's carrying a firearm in a vehicle for self-protection and why he did that. Um, the fact that he didn't come out of his house very often. The fact that he had blinds drawn at all times of the day and the evening. Um, the fact that he started carrying and possessing firearms at his house because he thought that people were going to break in and, and intruders were going to come and get him and try to kill him. That, that mental state that he had, he lived with all day long. And on May 31st, that paranoia got the best of him. And as a result of that, somebody got hurt. Other officers were there. I wasn't there. Your Honor, you weren't there. None of us were there except for these officers that are in the back of the courtroom with Martin. Whether Martin intended on, on hurting somebody, intended on killing somebody, or just wanted to be left alone to protect himself, we won't know. But what we do know, Your Honor, is that the jury has returned a verdict, a verdict that carries with it very serious consequences in counts 1 through 14 and also 17. This is not a, a case that Mark and Robin should truly receive a maximum sentence. This is a case that I would respectfully indicate to the court that there should be a sentence on the low end, if not uh, the minimum sentence being imposed. There are many factors that favor Mark and the fact that he had no prior criminal record. Um, when you look at the, the sentencing factors of 29, 29, 12C, uh, 
the court's required to look at whether there's substantial grounds uh, that exist to mitigate the offender's conduct. I believe there are, Your Honor. The life that he lived, the fact that he's a college uh, graduate, that he was a corrections officer, that he had no prior criminal record, uh, that he was in his home at that time, the result that he suffers from a significant uh, a traumatic brain injury accompanied with PTSD. These are all factors that the court has the right to consider and should. These factors, I think, when you look at them, this was an isolated incident. Martin's not on the street selling drugs. He's not on the street hurting people. He's not on the street conducting criminal activity. He's in his home. And if the court believes everything the jury did, if the court believes that these kids are guilty and that he did do these things intentionally, then the court also has to understand that he was in his home at that time. That he was in his home shot his firearms and he was trying to protect himself. Now, with that being said, one of the other things that the court is required to look at and hopefully accomplish is not sentencing in, in a disparate way. Uh, I've had an opportunity to, to do some research over the weekend and I will tell you, Judge Cook, that, that I've, I've seen some of your sentences and I find them to be, to be very fair, to be very consistent. You are a judge who is very thoughtful and when you sentence an individual, you tell them why you're sentencing them. Uh, I looked at the Adam Ortiz sentence, and you indicated, this is a quote from you, uh, there's no metric of justice, fairness, proportionality, or reasonableness to send a non, excuse me, to send a man to prison for nine years for a single minor violation. I understand the Ortiz sentence is a little bit different than what Mr. Robinson is sentencing, but I found those words to be Awful. I found them to be important when it comes to having a sentence that's not disparate to what another individual charged with these same offenses. Police officer have a difficult job. We know that. We know that they're out there and they take on risks. A man has been injured and a man almost lost his life. But it's a man. It's not a police officer, but a man. And that's how the court should sentence. The fact that there's an individual who didn't die. Mr. Robinson charged with an attempted aggravated murder of this individual, and that no one else was hurt in this situation. Your Honor, I think with the significant amount of times Kitty was hurt, Mr. Robinson was shot three times as well. But I think with the, the significant amount of counts that this jury returned a verdict on, 15 total, the court has a significant amount of time that it would pose just on the two specs alone. Mr. Roberts is looking at 14 years. On the, the F1 carried with him a, a minimum sentence of three years as well, which I believe is what the state has elected for him to be sentenced on. Your Honor, I would ask that the court truly consider the, the circumstances of Mr. Robinson, uh, the, the mental state that he was in at that time, and sentence Mr. Robinson to the minimum sentence in this case. Thank you. Thank you, Attorney Roder. <coughs> Mr. Robinson, this is your opportunity to address the court, to say anything in mitigation, to say anything to the victims or their families, or to say anything that you believe you'd like me to consider, sir. Is there anything you'd like to say? Yes. Okay. Um, I'd like it to be known that I maintain my innocence. You know I was found guilty. I'm not gonna sit here and say I show any remorse for the so-called victims or victim. If someone came to his house and did what he did, I'm sure he would feel just like I do. It's human nature. I lived all my life According to the laws of this fine county, of this fine state, of the United States of America, I've done my best to follow the laws, uphold the laws, and now I'm being judged on one inch sole incident.
recommended to me that I remain silent. speak too much, you don't want to incriminate yourself, but I have a lot to say. I was warned not to upset Judge D. Chris Cook because he might give me a harsher sentence. I asked that the court give me the sentence as just. Show me any lenience. Don't be any harsh. For, for a punishment to be just, it has to be firm, fair, consistent, swift. If I've done something wrong, you need to advise me of that. Tell me what I've done wrong. I don't do it again. Throughout my life, I had a supervisor. Attorney Sill is wrong. He's wrong on many accounts on how he betrayed me. I don't have a problem with authority. I've worked under authority. What I don't have a problem is telling someone if I think they're wrong. Just because they're in that position doesn't mean they're the, all, the know-all, the end-all. Nothing further, Your Honor. Thank you, Mr. Robinson. I have a few brief observations, and then I'll get to the formality of actually sentencing you. First of all, I do agree with Attorney Yoder to some extent, this has been a tragedy um, for everybody, but certainly the Picasso family and the officers involved. By all accounts, uh, up until July of 2009, Mr. Robinson did lead a pretty normal life. He was educated, he had a very good job, um, pretty normal guy up until that point. And, but what happened to him, as tragic as that was, is not a defense or even a justification to what occurred. Uh, the events of May in 2018 were avoidable and senseless. In fact, they were orchestrated by Mr. Robinson. Your conduct that day changed many people's lives, almost killed a police officer doing nothing other than his job. And as Prosecutor Sillow noted in his closing statement, how ironic that a law enforcement officer with, with a decent career, injured by other law enforcement officers, would flip the table and put himself in the same position. There's also been some <coughs> criticisms or questions, and I do not mean this in any way disparagingly to counsel for the, Mr. Robinson. He did an excellent job with a very difficult case. But there's been some criticisms or at least questioning of police actions. I think the exact opposite occurred. I think that officers in this case showed tremendous patience over the hours they waited and the efforts they made to see that this ended peacefully. They showed tremendous restraint even after being shot and only fired to protect themselves and to protect the fallen officers or officers who were trapped. In fact, there was two officers who had clean shots at Mr. Robinson throughout the evening. Officer Costanza saw him in the window, but he didn't fire. And Officer Cross saw him when he came out of the backyard and before he went back in and again did not shoot. And most importantly, that night, we saw tremendous bravery by Officer Behrens and Firefighter Rowe. They put themselves in danger more to danger, harm's way to save and help Officer Potasic. Those two men are heroes, and they should be recognized today. My job is to protect the public, and as Attorney Yoder properly indicates, there are many factors that the court has to consider when sentencing a felon convicted of any crime, but particularly crimes of this nature. But the number one job I have is to protect this community. And given all that transpired on May 31st, 2018, the fact that the defendant has not shown remorse or accepted responsibility, though he does have no criminal record and serious mitigating factors, as he pointed out and Mr. Yoder points out, neither a fully maximum sentence of over 100 years nor a minimum sentence is appropriate, but a substantial and significant sentence is. This court has reviewed the sentencing factors 
considered all the statements of the parties. Considered the overriding purposes and principles of felony sentencing pursuant to 29-29-11. Considered the seriousness and recidivism factors relevant to the offense and the offender and the need for deterrence, incapacitation, rehabilitation, and restitution. This is a judgment of this court. The sentence of law that a prison sentence is consistent with the purposes and principles of felony sentencing. The defendant is not amenable to a community control sanction due to the seriousness of the defendant's conduct, its impact on the victim, and the victim's family. A prison sentence is reasonably necessary to deter the offender in order to protect the public from future crime. And a prison sentence will not place an unnecessary burden on government resources. Accordingly, it's hereby ordered the defendant shall serve terms of incarceration at Lorraine Correctional Institution State Penitentiary as follows. Um, bear with me, this is somewhat complex. Counts one, two, and four merge. The state is elected on count three, so there'll be no sentence on those counts except for count three. On count three, the state is electing on firearm specification one, correct? Yes, Your Honor. There will be a seven year sentence on firearm specification one, followed by the maximum penalty possible for the attempted murder, aggravated murder charge, I'm sorry, for the felonious assault charge of 11 years, for a total of 18 years on count one. Counts five and six are also allied in count six will merge. The sentence on count five, attempted murder, Officer Ortiz. The state is electing on firearm specification one once again. Yes, Your Honor. Seven year sentence will be imposed and a five year sentence will be imposed in that case for a 12 year sentence. Counts one and two will have 30 year sentences. Counts seven and eight, Officer Barron's, the state is electing on count seven and firearm specification one. There will be no, there will be a seven year firearm specification, but it will be run concurrent. However, there will be a five year sentence for Officer Barron's as count of attempted murder run consecutive. Counts nine and 10, Officer Golick, attempted murder. The state is elected on count nine and firearm specification one. Firearm specification seven years, that will run concurrent to the other firearm specification. There will be a five year sentence on count nine, aggravated murder consecutive. Counts 10 and 11, count 10 merges to count 11. I'm sorry, counts 11 and 12. Count 12 merges to count 11, the state is electing on count 11. Officer Castanis, a seven year firearm specification which will merge five years consecutive for that attempted murder. Counts 13 and 14 deal with Officer Bailey, attempted murder. The state is electing on count 13, count 14 merges. There will be a seven year gun specification that is concurrent, five years consecutive on Officer Bailey for that attempted murder. The defendant was found not guilty on counts 15 and 16. Count 17, felonious assault, Officer Hume, filed seven year firearm specification count one, which will run concurrent to the other specifications count 17, felonious assault, five years consecutive with Officer Hume. Counts 18, 19, and 20 were not guilty. Count 21, inducing panic is a misdemeanor, six months in Lane County Jail. That will run concurrent as a matter of law. Accordingly, the sentences are two seven year firearm specifications to run consecutive to each other for 14 years, followed by count three, 11 years, the maximum sentence regarding Officer Potasek's charge for 25 years. And then the remaining firearm specifications are all concurrent. And the remaining six five year sentences for 30 years will all be run consecutive for a total of 55 years. The 11 years regarding count, uh, Officer Potasek's count, count three, is also a mandatory sentence. In imposing consecutive sentences, this court finds that consecutive sentences are necessary to protect the public, punish the offender, and are not disproportionate. The court fur further finds that the crimes were committed while awaiting trial, sentencing, under sanction, or under post release control, that two or more multiple offenses combined as a single course of conduct, and the harm was so great and unusual that a single term does not adequately affect the seriousness of the conduct. It is further ordered the defendant be granted any credit for a day spent in custody on this case, as well as any transportation days awaiting transportation to the Lorraine Correctional Institution and any earned credits he may be entitled to. Mr. Robinson is advised not to ingest or be injected with any drug of abuse as he'll be required to submit to random and scheduled drug testing in the institution. <coughs> because he's been sentenced to prison, I have to remind you of post release control. Post release control in your case is mandatory for a period of five years. Mr. Robinson, if you are placed on post release control and you violate the terms of post release control, the Ohio Adult Parole Authority is authorized to return you to prison for nine months for each 
violation up to a maximum of 50% of the stated prison terms for all violations. If you're convicted of a new felony while on post release control, in addition to being punished for the new offense, the court can terminate the term of post release control and impose a prison term for the post release control violation. If the court imposes a prison term for a post release control violation and a prison term for a new felony, those sentences must be served consecutively to each other. Now, uh, before we get to the restitution issue, Mr. Robinson, you have a right to appeal this matter. Um, if you're unable to pay the cost of an appeal, you have a right to appeal without payment. If you're unable to obtain counsel for appeal, counsel will be appointed without cost. And if you're unable to pay the cost of documents, those documents will be provided without cost. <coughs> you have a right to have an appeal known, appeal timely filed on your behalf. I do want to be clear though, Mr. Robinson, if you indicate at some point that you want me to appoint a lawyer for me and that you're indigent and cannot afford an attorney, you are going to fill out a financial affidavit form that I will scrutinize to see that you're available or to see that you're eligible. And if you are, an attorney will be appointed for you. If you're not eligible or you fail to fill out a financial affidavit similar to what we went through previously, I will not appoint an attorney for you. Um, attorney Yoder, my understanding you have agreed, you're not sure if you're gonna handle the appeal, but you've agreed to make sure a notice of appeal is filed for Mr. Robinson. Yes, Your Honor, I'll, I'll make sure that notice gets filed properly. Good, and then let me know if uh, I need to be involved further relative to uh, any council issues. Yes, sir. All right, uh, at this time, the state of Ohio, um, I'm gonna ask you to briefly proceed on the issue of restitution so that we can have that addressed at the same time so that all matters are preserved for appeal and dealt with today. Call uh, Detective Boyd into the stand here. Officer, if you come on up. Task Force, uh, they reported a financial loss of $2,308.04. The Lorain County Sheriff's Department uh, <clears throat> advised that they had a financial loss of $1,991.07. The North Ridgeville Police Department uh, had a financial loss of $2,118.65. The Avon Lake Fire Department had a financial loss of $963.92. The United States Marshal Service had a financial loss of $3,840. The Lorraine Police Department had a financial loss of $4,994.21. The Elyria Police Department had a financial loss of $25,537.96. What was that directly responsible for? I mean, well, we were in charge of the investigation, and that was strictly the overtime. Okay. Go on. Romanian Police Department had uh, two separate reports of loss, $1,305.33 and then $419.57. Um, Sheffield Lake also reported two uh, losses in their patrolman, uh, $183.56 and $91.58. And then the cost to board up Mr. Robinson's house uh, came out to $949. <coughs> The total loss for these departments was 
It's up $102 at 89 cents. Okay, and that has the accompanying paperwork on uh, what date exhibit one as well? Correct. Your Honor, with that, I would also ask the court to take judicial notice of the definition of economic harm as is contained in 23, or 29.17.31, the statute we're talking about, which includes all costs incurred by the state or any political subdivision as a result of or in making any response to criminal conduct that constitute a violation of this section, which is inducing panic. Very well. Uh, Attorney Yoder, any questions for the officer? Yes, please. Detective White, a leader of police department got involved in this case as a result of a mutual aid agreement that they have with Lorraine, is that correct? Correct. Uh, and you were the detective assigned that task of investigating this particular situation that occurred on May 31st? Correct. Um, did you have a, a supervisor that you answered to, Sergeant Lieutenant Captain? Correct. Uh, each. Okay. Um, when you were investigating this case, did you have to get approval from either of those individuals in regards to whether you got permission to work overtime? <coughs> of course. Did they grant you that permission? Yes. Why was that a requirement for you that you had to work overtime uh, in, in regards to this case? Because it was a large amount of work that had to be done in a short amount of time. Well, it occurred on May 31st, 2018. Mr. Robinson was an indicted for, for brought to this facility for many, many months thereafter. Is that correct? Correct. Do you have any idea how many months you had to investigate it before an indictment was even filed? Uh, as soon as I got done investigating it, that's when we came to the prosecutor's office and started presenting the case. You had other detectives that helped you work this case? Correct. How many total? Uh, during the investigation, pretty much every one of them helped me in some capacity. How many would that be? Uh, we've got uh, uh, nine, I believe. Now, it's your job to investigate alleged crimes that took place, correct? Correct. Nobody else can do that, right? Average citizens, John Doe, they can't do that. You have to be from the law enforcement agency. Correct. And your job, you're an employee of the Laird Police Department, correct? Correct. You work 40 hours a week? Yes. Okay. Um, were there other outside agencies that also assisted in the investigation? Yes. And were you the person who controlled what they did as well? No. Who was the one who controlled that? Whoever their immediate supervisor was. May I see that detail real quick? Sure. for Gordon Adams and Sean Bailey. Okay, so Adams and Bailey, Vermillion PD, but they were on the SWAT team, they were called out on May 31st to seven seven eight dollars Yes. Okay. Is that overtime or is that just regular pay? Uh, it says overtime rate. Okay. And the overtime would be as a result of the fact that this was happening over a longer period of time? I don't know on that. It's what they quoted whenever they asked, were asked what they spent. But they just put it for the overtime. I don't know if they put it for the regular pay. Okay. The, the $25,000 approximately that was submitted by the Larry PD, do you have any idea how much of that was your overtime pay? I do not. Were there other detectives who had also received overtime pay? I'm sure they did. We were called out at 2 a.m. in the morning, so 
everybody would get all over time. Restitution owed in the amount of forty-four thousand seven hundred two eighty-nine. The cost of this prosecution, as well as the uh, attorney fees for uh, attorney till up till the date that attorney Yoder entered his appearance, I will not task or I'll not uh, cast the costs of attorney Toad after the point attorney Yoder made his appearance. Um, the court finds Mr. Robinson financially able to pay financial sanctions at this time. Um, Prosecutor Sello, prosecutor, does order anything further? No, Your Honor. Any other? Yeah, just, just to want to make sure the record, for, to, to have a clear record, uh, the defense is objecting to that restitution order. I understood. Thank you. Clearly. I just wasn't sure whether that was indicated. Your objections are noted. Thank you. Um, if there's nothing further at this time, I will remand Mr. Robinson to Larry County Jail for transportation to LCI. Oh, I'm sorry. One other thing, Your Honor. Um, actually, uh, in speaking to law enforcement, uh, we have a significant amount of weapons and materials that are still in. I'm asking, uh, pursuant to Criminal 26, to return State Exhibit 18, Deputy Ortiz's DCMS Model 160, State Exhibit 24, Deputy Hume's Colt SMG. Officer Tibbetts, Colt 223, Exhibit 28, Officer Barron's rifle, State Exhibit 29, Officer Bailey's rifle, State Exhibit 32, Officer Ramsey's personal 308, State Exhibit 19, Officer Potassic's DPMS model on 160, State Exhibit 20, the Halligan tool, and State Exhibit 25, Officer Gallic shield. Um, that that, that uh, criminal rule allows us to put in photographs to substitute um, instead of the actual object have done prior to return. I have prepared an entry granting that. I, I don't know how defense deals are. Mr. Uh, uh, Yoder, you'll be heard on that issue. Judge, here's, here's my only issue that I would raise, and, and that's because I'm not necessarily the one who will be doing the appeal. My concern is limiting any appellate counsel's right to expect, review, potentially try to do uh, any DNA testing of those weapons as well. So what? for purposes of our record, we would be objecting. What's the code section, Mr. Yoder? about any, in fact, I don't think there was even any questions relative to the expert, the PCI expert who testified about DNA. So I don't, I don't, I don't know that the evidentiary value of those weapons or the shield would prejudice the defendant by not letting them go back to law enforcement. So over the objection of the defendant, I'll sign the entry that law enforcement can make arrangements to get the weapons and the shield back. Anything further, Mr. Silva, Ms. Zork? No, you're right. Uh, Attorney Yoder? No. All right. Mr. Robinson will be remanded back to the Custom Lorraine County Sheriff for transfer to LCI. Good luck to you, sir. All right.